Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on Think Tech's Connecting Hawaii Business. My name is Kathleen Lee with Kathleen Lee Consulting, and I am your host for today. So on our show, we are going to talk about, <clears throat> sorry, my throat got a little caught there, COVID-19 and early inmate releases. And our guest today is um, Nick Lindblad. But before I go into his introduction, um, if you do have any live questions that you would like to send us, you can send it to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. Now with that, that being said, let me go ahead and introduce Nick Lindblad. Hey Nick, thanks for being on the show today. Hey, how's it going? So, tell us about yourself. Tell you about me. Well, um, I'm a local boy, first and foremost, born and raised in Honolulu. Um, I'm a townie. And a lot of times when people ask, like, you know, about yourself, what they really mean is, oh, what high school you went? And then they make all kinds of judgments, right? But um, I went to St. Louis, born and raised here. Um, I've been a bail bondsman licensed since 2004. I'm a second generation bail bondsman. My dad actually is a 40 plus year um, bail agent. Um, so I've been working here in Hawaii. Um, I run A1 bail bonds. And yeah, the mission is just to fight the good fight and help people get out of custody and then guarantee that they return to court for the court appearances. And going back to basics, what are bail bonds, Nick? What are bail bonds? Okay, mm -hmm. so um, a bail bond is an insurance-based product or service. It's a way to get out of custody through posting a bond. So what that means is I could basically just post a bond, get somebody out of custody, and then as long as they go to court, everything is all good. Now, there are several different ways to get out of custody. First and foremost, and I think the best way is if you have the financial means, it's just to post the cash. So if you have a bail for maybe $500 because you got a DUI on a three-day weekend, um, most people, okay. they have a third party or they themselves post the $500 cash. It gets them out of custody. And then at the end of their um, case, which is usually about a year, you'll get your money back. The court will hold that money as an incentive to secure your appearance in court. Um, once you're done with court, you get your money back. That's how you get out through just posting cash. That's like the ideal way for those who have the means. Now, say you don't have the cash and say your bail set to something way higher, like $10,000. If you have like a really big bail, you could instead, if you don't have the 10,000, which most people don't, you could instead hire a bail bondsman to post a bail bond for that $10,000 amount However, there's a catch. There's two things that we require. First, a co-signer. That means somebody to sign and guarantee that the person goes to court. And then we also charge a fee, which is not returned to you. That fee is typically 10% of the amount of the bail. So $10,000 bond means $1,000 fee. Um, then there's the free ways to get out, but um, you have to qualify. If you have like a perfect... A uh, record, it's clean, and then you're accused of a crime that's really nominal, maybe like a misdemeanor, um, you can just get let out on your own recognizance or ROR, released on your own recognizance. That's like ideal because there's no real conditions that you have to adhere to besides the basic ones like, hey, return to court and don't go take off to another place and not return. Um, and then the... Um, the, the trade-off is there's conditions and they vary. If you have to go through supervised release, own recognizance release is number one. Supervised release is an option that's free for the defendant. However, there could be conditions like you got to submit to urinary um, analysis. You got to check in with an intake service worker. You got to have a curfew. You got to wear an electronic monitor. There could be like all different types of conditions, but it is the advantages. It is free. It's taxpayer supported, but it is free if you could qualify for it. Okay, and, and as we're talking about going back to basics and you went over what exactly bail bonds are, I know we mentioned this a few days ago when we were talking about this, uh, and one of your pet peeves is how people kind of uh, interchange the term jail and prison. Can you go over that for a bit before we launch into you know, more of a discussion? 
Yeah, totally. So I got called out on this because I made the mistake and then I realized, oh my God, I've been making this mistake and I felt kind of shame. But an actual <laughs> judge pointed this out to me because okay. I was really just nervous because he's a judge and he's a retired judge, but he's running for city prosecutor. And I just got nervous. I used them back and forth. But a jail is where people are held pre-trial. A prison is where people are held long term and they're serving sentences. So if something happens and you're just accused of a crime, you've been charged with a crime and you don't bail out, you'll be at OCCC, which is our jail, pre-trial jail. However, if something happens and you do have to serve a term um, of imprisonment, multiple years, you'll go to our prison, which is Halava. Um, that's the difference between a jail and a prison. Okay. And, and, uh, and on that note, like who sets bail? Like how is, how is bail set? That's kind of like a controversial subject and there aren't like defined, like there's not like a published book that says this is how we set bail. So you kind of have to get all the information from experience and from different parties who tell you um, how bail is traditionally set. So for most people, this is the way to think about it. When you're arrested, a detective or a police officer will submit a report and make a recommendation on what the amount of the bail should be. The prosecutor's office has to also review the report and sort of give input on what they believe um, the bail should be as well. Once those two like sets of input are submitted, um, the court confirms a bail amount. Um, it's unclear who has the heavier influence, the police or the prosecutor's office, but they do settle on a number and the court usually just confirms in a majority of cases, whatever they come to terms on. So whatever your bail is set at, that's what you have to deal with if you wanna post bail and get out of custody, like right when you get charged with crime. Okay, and let's tie in one of the viewer questions that we received. How does, let me go ahead and read this, how does one go about getting a bail bond in instances where someone needs to collateralize something? Okay, so uh, basically you shouldn't need collateral if you're um, doing a bond that's probably under $150,000. Okay. So, Here's the thing with collateral, and we'll break it down. There's the confusing thing where people think like, oh, maybe I don't have the money. Is there any way I could just submit collateral and get my loved one out? Mm -hmm. What they're basically getting mixed up is the difference between qualifying for a bail bond and paying the fee, and then not having the fee, and then like substituting in like a car title or, you know, jewelry things that like they could substitute for fee. Sure. So if you're talking about trying to find a way to not pay the fee, there really isn't a way around that. Um, on larger cases, like ones that have bails that are set to like $250,000, $500,000, in order to qualify for a bail bond, you're gonna need three things. One, the cosigner, two, the fee, and then lastly, collateral, because it's such a large amount. Typically, bondsmen just take um, a lien on a piece of property, and it's only like paperwork. It doesn't actually become something where you could have your house taken away unless the defendant absconds, you have to pay the court the entire amount, and then by filing that mortgage lien on somebody's property, you have that first position. Um, so mm -hmm. upon sale, you can get paid back the money that you're owed. But that's like really big bonds, like 250,000, 500,000, really big bonds that you actually need um, collateral to qualify. Okay, and on that note, this is, we're doing this really smoothly. On that note, we can tie in the next viewer question, which is, do you have an opinion about what constitutes excessively high bail for a person? Yeah, so when people talk about the bail system and they say things like end cash bail or end money bail or people are languishing in custody just because of uh, cash bail, well, yes and no. I think it's not that simple. 
I think there are two things that should never happen in the criminal justice system. Number one is when your bail is set excessively high. So if I'm like an 18 year old kid, there's no way for me to have like, you know, this robust um, cash flow and like property. Like if I'm 18 and I've been accused of something, you know, maybe a class B or C felony, which isn't the most serious, like an A, but maybe a B or a C, bail should be set reasonably to guarantee that I go back to um, court. It shouldn't be leveraged to keep me in custody as the 18 year old kid who can't afford a million dollar bail or a $500,000 bail. I think when you set bails excessively high, that has a function, whether people want to admit it or not, the function and the result is people just languish in custody because they don't have the money to post the bail. It's set too high. Um, the second way that I think um, cash is leveraged to detain people is when bails are set to cash only. Um, bail could be set to cash only and say your bail is $20,000. If it's set to cash only, it means only submitting $20,000 cash will get you out. Now, that's unreasonable. A majority of everyday Americans can't even afford like an emergency of like maybe four or $500. There's no way for somebody to get 20 grand to get their loved one out. I think when bail is set to cash only, that's like an abuse of the, the cash element of bail. And then when it's set excessively high and it's only function is to keep people in custody, that's wrong as well. So let's uh, go back to the title of the show, which is COVID-19 and early inmate release. And uh, let's talk about how this pandemic has the way how this pandemic has affected the way that you've done your job as a, a bail agent. So could you go into that? You know what the first uh, surprise was, now when I get people out, I have to make sure that they pass the Department of Health sort of clearance. They test them for COVID. I think they're trying to do like contract tracing. So you have to release like, um, I don't have to, but the inmate has to say like, oh, if they're staying somewhere, um, what their address is, they have to stay in contact with um, the Department of Health to report back. Um, if they're feeling like bad or they get tested, now there's like a way to trace. So the Department of Health coming in to administer COVID tests, I think is a big change. It delays releases a little bit, but of course it's worth it because we need to trace um, the people who do have um, COVID-19 and then the people around them, they need to be warned so that, you know, they don't continue the, the spike. So that's one wrinkle. Um, when it comes to doing things contact free, tell you the truth, I did a lot of that back in 2019. Um, if people wanted to get a bail bond, they could do everything on their phone in about five or six minutes. They could pay in about a minute or two. And then I don't really need to meet anybody to do a bail bond. I could just do it over the internet or do it over um, phone, tablet, computer, they could do the electronic signature, they could pay. I'll go to the courthouse, I'll go drop off the bond, I'll go give them a call when it's time to pick up their loved one, but I could do it basically contactless and I've actually done people on other islands and I've just had them fill out my online application, send me a selfie so that, you know, they send me a selfie and their tattoos and that's been a contact-free way to do it. And okay, really hold that thought because I, I really want you to go more into that after the break. So you already talked about you doing contactless and then let's go further um, into what else, what other factors have affected your business since the pandemic. Hi, I'm Rusty Kamori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. I feature a wide range of amazing guests who share valuable insights about how going beyond the lines leads to success in everything you do in life. I'm looking forward to you joining me every Monday at 11 a.m. Aloha.
Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Connecting Hawaii Business. My name is Kathleen Lee, and our guest on the show today is Nick Lindland, a bail bonds agent, and we are talking about COVID-19 and early inmate releases. So when we left off, we were discussing how the pandemic has either changed or shifted the bail bonds industry. Um, Nick, you want to pick up from that? Yeah, sure. I think one of the great innovations to come from the pandemic that most people are experiencing now is video conferencing. And that's been tremendous for the judiciary because now hearings that, to tell you the truth, I felt as though previously never needed to technically be an in-person live hearing. Now those types of hearings can just be held via teleconference or video conference. I think that's a tremendous um, like tool for the judiciary because they've got plenty of cases. There's always lots of people, you know, getting charged with things. And there's always these, you know, sometimes it's serious. Yeah, you have to be there to say not guilty. But when that's the only thing that that hearing was for, most people will say, hey, I could do that via video conference or teleconference. Now, of course, you should never have a trial via Zoom. You know, you do have the right to face your accuser and you can't have like a jury of 12 people all reporting via Zoom, you know, during a trial. I'm not going to go there. But um, when it comes to like hearings like calendar call or status conference or arraignment and plea where you literally have to take a day off just to go to court at like 830 and say not guilty then leave video conferencing that's the way to go it's the efficient way to do it and it's the cheaper way to make sure that like people don't have to spend money you know on transport coming in and it's more efficient for the court right um i know you had sent a couple of articles about like early um uh, prison or inmate releases. And we actually have a, a viewer question that kind of goes along with that. So I'd, I'd want you to address this as well. So the question is, uh, John Oliver did a piece about how there are massive <clears throat> spikes of um, COVID-19 in prisons. Have you seen the same thing in Hawaii? Okay, John Oliver. I once saw like years ago, he really had a negative like piece on the bail bond industry. And I've always wanted to point out all the things that he had wrong on that piece, but I haven't done that video yet. But when it comes to COVID-19, it's, you know, a pandemic that we've never had to deal with in our, lifetime, in our lifetimes uh, here in America. Of course, there's always been different um, viruses um, across the world, especially in Asia, but they never seem to really hit Hawaii or the US the way that they did um, in other places. Um, across the globe. But when it comes to like the pandemic, we all sort of got caught on our heels. And that's because the prison system and the judicial system is fragile. I don't think there's any way else to put it. If you stress a system, you got to be able to like pivot, you got to be able to change on the fly, and you got to be able to do what's right for the people in custody and the, the attorneys working, uh, the judicial staff, the ACOs want to protect themselves from being exposed. We totally were caught on our heels when it came to reacting to this. And it's because we've just kicked the can down the road on prison overcrowding and just jail slash prison overcrowding in general. OCCC is crowded, um, Halava, um, all of our facilities are in decrepit repair. And until we fix that, we're not going to be in a position of strength when something happens. We're going to be caught sort of like, it's kind of like insurance. You can't time insurance. If you happen to have an accident and need to go to the ER, you can't know that the morning of sign up for health insurance, pay your premium. And then later that afternoon when you need it, oh, thank God I did that. It has to be done on the front end before there's you know the overcrowding because the overcrowding just makes it dangerous for one the spread of the virus two it makes it like not impossible but highly like very difficult for the acos the um corrections officers or acos adult correction officers acos to like do their job because there's unrest in the prison um you just want to make sure that you if you're gonna have to have a facility to hold people it has to be done in a humane way, a clean way to help combat those things. But 
we didn't do that. We got caught on our heels. O Triple C is overcrowded. It's had bouts with like infestation. There's high like emotions over you know the the the, the way that people are held in custody in those conditions and the pandemic didn't help. So it's because we were caught on our heels because we didn't bother strengthening the system, strengthening the jails, making sure that it's not overcrowded so that we could react to something like that. That's what I think happened with that. And I know you're very passionate about, you know, what you do and helping people out. And so we have about maybe like eight, nine minutes. And I know like when I ask this question, you're, you could probably talk for like hours on this but we're gonna try to keep it to like eight, nine minutes. What okay. are your suggestions for solutions or reform? Oh, to decrease um, the overcrowding? Mm -hmm. Okay, number one, it's the front end of the process. There's a lot of things that people are arrested for that they didn't need to be arrested for. And like, it's one thing to be sort of like charged with a crime, but in many cases, you could be cited, you could show up to court, and then at the end, the court could determine your punishment all the same. Of course, these are for small, you know, driving without insurance or, you know, other misdemeanor um, things where you could just be like given a citation and you don't have to go down to the police station. You don't have to make bail. You don't have to take a chance on the court not letting you out on your own recognizance and then languishing um, at OCCC. You could instead cite people for certain crimes and have them go to court. And then if they don't go to court, that contempt um, warrant that's generated, then those could be the things that have to be arrestable offenses because you've already displayed that you're supposed to go to court. You didn't. And now you're going to get arrested for that small um, misdemeanor um, charge. That's number one. We don't need to arrest as many people as we currently do. And then that'll have like the effect of like lessening the amount of people who may languish in custody later. That's okay. number one. Number two, we need to like be more truthful in general about the bail system. I get attacked as a bail bondsman because we have a service that's a private sector service. And many people believe that it should just be run by the public sector. But if you did a review of all the jurisdictions that only have a public sector um, release method, you find that they have the exact same overcrowding issues. And in some cases, it's actually worse because crime goes up. New York is an example of when they got rid of cash bail the crime rate went up double digits. Harris County, which is Houston, is another example. And these are just this year where they got rid of cash requirements in the bail system. Um, violent crime as well as nonviolent crime went up double digits. Um, so it's super important that we just be truthful and we use the other jurisdictions on the mainland as an example of what we should okay. do here in Hawaii. Um, specific to the release um, system here um, in Hawaii, we do have a dynamic system. We have optionality. You could one, post cash, that's the best. Two, you can go through a bail bondsman, that's an option. Three, you could hope for release on your own recognizance. Or four, you can get out through supervised release with conditions. Those last two, own recognizance, as well as supervised release, are absolutely free to the defendant. So it's not money that's keeping people at OCCC. It's that they can't qualify for supervised release. So the reform should be just as strong when it comes to reforming cash bail. And those two um, cash examples, when it's set excessively high or when it's set to cash only, that needs to be reformed. And the exact same thing is true uh, within the intake service center who controls um, supervised release. They make recommendations on whether somebody should be let out on supervised release or not. Okay. That needs to be reformed as well. I was just talking with an attorney about, you know, this exact issue. And the attorney said, you know what? I filed a petition to get my client out. And then I found out that the intake service center, when they do their bail study, they don't even consider the financial part, like what the person is able to pay. And I was like, wow, that seems strange. That, that 
if somebody can't bail out, you think you'd want to ask that question so that you could maybe make a recommendation for a lower bail. But the way that the um, intake service center does bail reports right now, there's no like section in the bail study to say, hey, what would be a more realistic um, bail amount, say if they didn't qualify for supervised release. And I think I'll kind of like wrap it up on this last critical point. When you have optionality, several different ways to get out of custody, that is an overall more healthy way to reach the goal of getting people out of custody. You want as much options as possible. If you were to just have government options, which means detain or release, what do you do if the judge says, no, we're gonna detain you? You have no other recourse. So it's super important that if we wanna have, if we wanna be truthful and it's really about getting people out of custody, it has to be, let's get people out of custody. We can't argue amongst ourselves and say, no, we want to reduce prison overcrowding. But by the way, it has to be the way that I want to do it. It has to be this certain way. I think the goal is to get people out of custody. And to do that, everything's on the table, all hands on deck. It's not, nah, it's got to be my way. That's just not the way that I think it's very productive to try to solve the problem, which is so complex and so, I mean, it's just such a huge deal. I agree. And if people want to learn more about bail bonds or want to talk to you further about this, this subject, how can they contact you? Okay. I made a YouTube station specifically for this. Um, my name, I go by A1 Nick with A1 Bail Bonds. I tried to brand myself that way. I hope you could just go to YouTube and put A1 Bail Bonds and that should show up with like literally, I think I have a hundred something videos um, how to turn in and bail out in under an hour, um, little tips and tricks to make sure that you can get through the system, um, when to hire a private attorney versus go with the public defender. I have videos on all that, and that's a good reference. We also have the videos on Facebook. I'm hoping that I've branded myself well enough where you could just put A1 bail bonds into Google or YouTube, and it should pop <laughs> up with lots of information. Did you already mention your email address as well? Uh, you can hit me up on Facebook through... Um, our A1 site. If you want to email me directly, it's my name, Nicholas Lindblad at gmail.com. Um, you can call me if you just put A1 bail bonds into any you know, search <laughs> engine. I, you should be able to just call and I'm available. Um, yeah, plenty of ways to get in touch with me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick, for coming on the show today. And for our viewers out there who may not have caught this on live stream, it will be on thinktechhawaii.com as well as thinktech's YouTube page. So again, thank you so much and have a good day. Aloha.